Welcome to the Friday Happy Hour with Victory Strategist, award-winning author and your Happy Hour host, Anne-Marie Kelly. Each week, Anne-Marie chats with women who have reinvented, started over or wrote fabulous next chapters. They share how they overcame their midlife challenges and how you can too. So kick back with some good happy hour something to drink and enjoy today's show. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour with me and Marie Kelly. I'm that recovering good girl and your victorious woman empowerment partner. And this is where us victory chicks and you men who care about us meet on Fridays to chat about things we can do to overcome our challenges and get empowered and make our lives sparkle. Thanks for joining me today. And listen, I hope you're thinking about goals for the new year. I am. And if you haven't been paying attention to your financial future, or maybe you've been ignoring it, our guest today is going to help you. She's Erin Arbidlund, and if her name sounds familiar, maybe it's because you read her financial column in the Philadelphia Inquirer or in Barron's. Or you might have read a book she wrote a while back about Bernie Madoff. Remember that, Lael? Erin was one of, the, one of the first financial people to start questioning what Bernie Madoff was doing. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But mostly, Erin is coming to Happy Hour to help us today so we can make some changes now to secure a better future. And so, are you ready for Christmas? Well, if you aren't, you're right there with most of the victory chicks I know. Or you're celebrating Hanukkah. Everyone I talk to is, and, and I hear it from, it doesn't matter. I hear it from everyone. I'm just not into it this year. At first, they thought, and you know I've been saying it, that it was about our unseasonably nice weather. Too nice to get in the Christmas mood. But, you know, yesterday I was sitting at my desk, and I was watching the, my computer screen do nothing. And I was ready to pull my hair out. It just, like, it just kept getting stuck. It didn't matter what I, what I was doing, it, whether it was in Word or if I was in QuickBooks, didn't matter. Then, and as I sat there next to tears... I realized something. Mercury is retrograde. And it's been like that all month. No wonder we've been feeling like we're in a time warp. I don't know if you remember when I had my astrologer cousin, Jonette McGeoch, on the show earlier this year. And she gave us a list of all the positive things about Mercury retrograde. And truthfully, there are some. Like, it's if you... If you it, it's a good time to go someplace new because if you can actually get there, it's someplace that you're probably going to go back to because it's a retrograde. But let's face it, astrologically speaking, Mercury r rules things c related to communication, like your relationships and your travel plans, even your mental faculties. And even though Mercury retrograde happens uh, uh, three or four times a year, when it happens in December... Because of everything else going on, it feels like you just keep plugging away, but nothing seems to be getting done. And this, to me, this next piece is a little bit scarier. Scarier for me, I'll bet it's scarier for you. You can't focus, and you feel like your whole head is in a fog. And maybe you're wondering if something else is going on. You know, like I always say, oh, my God, I hope this isn't the beginning of dementia. Well, I'm here to tell today to tell you that you can relax. It's not dementia. It's just Mercury retrograde. And the worst of it is over next Friday. So this coming week, when you're ready to pull your hair out or scream or like I was doing yesterday, crying, just keep repeating to yourself, Mercury goes direct on Friday. Mercury goes direct on Friday. Make it like a mantra. Then take a deep breath. And you'll feel yourself calm down in knowing that the crazy isn't you and it's only temporary. And 
in addition to mother to mercury retrograde mother nature is not helping the situation doesn't she know this is not a good time to shower us with snow and not real snow but this nuisance silly steady snow stream Ooh, how's that for some alliteration this silly steady snow stream isn't enough for us to stay home but it's just enough to make travel dicey and who needs that when you're out trying to get your shopping done and stuff you know I think the bears get it right you know the polar bears and the you know the regular bears the weather gets cold and they hibernate that's what I feel like doing don't you I could just snuggle up with Joseph a blanket some hot chocolate and popcorn and binge watch a couple of TV shows and then maybe for a little variation as it got later in the day, I'd had some hot buttered rum and some nachos. Doesn't that sound good about now? Although, I'm glad I wasn't hibernating yesterday. I had the nicest thing happen, and I want to share it with you. Remember me talking about the Girlfriend Gala? Well, of course you did. I was incessant about it. And this year's beneficiary is the newly minted Victorious Woman Scholarship at Newman University. It's specifically designed for women who are, like I was, a non-traditional student, a slightly older woman, slightly older woman who was returning to college to earn a degree and doing it at Newman, which I think is the best program for a woman who is taking that challenging step. Also, since I love that, that all the good, I love all the good work that good teachers do, the scholarship is earmarked for a woman who is earning a teaching degree. So I usually distribute the proceeds for, of the gala in the fall, but because I was working in, on writing my forthcoming book, The Five-Year Marriage, the process got delayed. But it was weighing on my mind. So last month I emailed Chrissy Farrell, the Director of Annual Giving Programs and Advancement Services, and said, let's get a date because I work better uh, against the deadline. So we did that, did that, and over the past two weeks, I did all the input into my QuickBooks. I finally found out how much the gala made. It was $3,000, which was pretty good for our little girlfriend gala. Then I went to Staples and had one of those big display checks, you know, like the 17 by 36 inch things. And, uh, and, you know, so we could do a nice photo op. And, of course, I wrote the actual check. Now, earlier this week, Chrissy emailed and told me that Henry Sumner, the Vice President for Institution, Institutional Advancement and University Relations, is, um, would be there to accept the check. And then she teased that there might be a special guest at our meeting. It was intriguing, but I had no idea who it could be. So when I got to, the, to Newman yesterday, I was curious. And I went up to Chrissy's office, and we chatted for a couple of seconds, and then she took me back to the meeting room where I got the best surprise. You re might remember, because I've talked about it several times at other happy hours, that when I decided to go back to college in 1998 to finally get my degree, I checked out most of the local schools and had, that had programs for people who, like me, had a full-time job, some college credits, but no degree. Of all the colleges around, I decided Newman had the best program. It's, it's, it was the program that I guess I would say the program that best suited my logistical needs. But you know how that first step of a journey is the hardest? Well, that for me, that was a phone call. And when I made that first phone call, I was so nervous. And the man who answered the phone that day was Bill Gagliardi. Now, since I graduated... Bill took an early retirement, but he's still active with Newman, and that's who Chrissy invited to join us yesterday. I was so excited. Bill doesn't even remember that I cried through that whole phone call. But he was so kind and got me to relax enough to get me to the next step. To the, That was their introductory seminar. Then when I got my transcripts from many colleges I attended over the years, and there were a lot, because, you know, as a Catholic school teacher, I went to any, any, universe, any of the Catholic schools, well, they were always Catholic schools, that offered a discounted tuition to Catholic school teachers. And it changed from year to year. So I ended up with college credits from St. Joe's, Gwynedd Mercy, Our Lady of Angels, Penn State, Delaware County Community College, and the Pennsylvania Realtors Institute. There 
that was a lot of transcripts to get. And then I had them all sent to Bill, and he helped me get my credits in order, and then he made a nice plan for me. And I followed it, and I got my degree. So Bill was really kind and sweet and helpful, and because he maintains tight ties with Newman, Chrissy was thoughtful enough to connect with Bill, and he was so nice to join us. And he brought me flowers. How nice was that? Who wouldn't feel blessed by that kind of a treat? So it was it was the nicest day I've had in about a month. Well, actually, it was probably the nicest day I've had since Mercury went retrograde at the beginning of December. And Chrissy Farrell, just in case you're listening, thank you for making such a fabulous day for me. And Bill Gagliardi, if you're listening, I was just tickled that you took the time to join us. And thanks for the flowers. And also for telling me that I was the only person in your group of students who passed the humanities CLEP test. For those of you who don't know, CLEPs are a way of testing out on, certain, uh, on a certain subject. And if you pass for $85, you can get between three and five credits. So Bill knew I really studied for the one I took, but I don't think I knew that I was the only one of his students who passed the humanities club, who took it and, and who actually passed it. So it was a bonus for me. So, oh, and by the way, last night I was thinking about it, and, you know, I, did, I don't think it was six credits. I think it was three credits. And you probably knew that, knew that Bill, and didn't say it. So that, too, Bill, was really sweet. And, you know, 16 years after my 2001 graduation, all that matters is that I did it. And, Bill, you were a part of that. So it was a good day and made possible by Chrissy Farrell. And also thanks to my girlfriend gala committee who worked their tails off, the donors and everyone who came because you helped me. You, you helped another woman who, as a teacher, will positively affect the lives of most likely hundreds of children. How cool is that? So indirectly, it's, it's like, you know, that ripple effect. It's the best. And listen, speaking of the best, Erin Arvidlund is here, and she's the best at financial things. And specifically today, some things you need to do for the new year. So go get some good happy hour something to drink and come back for some good conversation with me and Erin Arvidlund. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Remember when you wished you had more time for yourself? And now you have it, but you notice you're keeping busy with stuff, but that stuff isn't making you feel happy or filled up? And when you think about what would make you happy and filled up, you get stuck or feel overwhelmed. And then you go back to what's more familiar, more comfortable, even if it's not making you happy. Wouldn't you love to find a way to start making sense of that deep discontent you're feeling? Well, you're not alone. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. And I know there's a place for you, one that other women have found to be both inspirational and empowering. And it's the Victorious Woman Project. Go there now and get on my mailing list, where you'll be the first to know about my upcoming online workshops, teleseminars, and more. And while you're there, take a couple minutes to look over my blog. You can download some of the free stuff I have for you and let it get your creative juices going. I'm looking forward to meeting you at the Victorious Woman Project. And that's at www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour with me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and our guest today, Erin Arvidlund. Thanks for joining us today, Erin. Thanks for having me, Emery. Oh, I'm glad that you're here. Um, you know, Erin, let's talk a little bit about your background. Um, sure. Did you set out to become a financial journalist? <laughs> no. <laughs> no one does that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I grew up in the, in the area. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, my dad was a financial planner, so I kind of grew up around the industry, And um, but I always wanted to be a writer, so that's how I got into financial being a financial reporter. 
so you sort of combined what you wanted to do with like did you hear did you hear like all financial stuff growing up oh yeah yeah it was always you know like all right where's this stock gonna close today and you know the dow felt this this amount and so my sister and i both kind of ended up in the finance world she's a portfolio manager and i'm a i'm a writer oh how about that so i yeah i guess if you if that's all you're i was talking to somebody yesterday and he said that he he and his spouse were both science people and mm-hmm. so they brought their kids up always thinking about, you know, like any, some of the STEM things. And he has three kids, and all of them were involved in some in science in some way. So I guess, you, yeah. you know, you learn what you live. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, uh, you know, it's the background in, when you're growing up, and, and that's kind of what happened to us. Mm. You know, something I found fascinating, Erin, was that you were one of the first people to question mm-hmm. Bernie Madoff's pr- uh, practices. And your research resulted in your book, Too Good to Be True. Yeah. Why Why did you question what was going on with him? And and your book came out, he was arrested, I think, in 2009. Mm-hmm. Your book came out in 2009. So all that time, even before he was being investigated, you, you were investigating. Yeah, I had uh, written a story about him for Barron's magazine in 2001. Mm. Um, I, I didn't expose him by, at that point, but um, I just wrote a story essentially saying, you know, his returns are a little bit too uh, perfect. He had never had a down year, and um, this is, you know, in 2001, obviously, the stock market was crashing because we had the dot-com bust. Oh, right. And no one seemed to be able to explain to me how he made money. Um, but, you know, I interviewed a, a lot of investors who, you know, loved his, loved the returns. They liked the steadiness of it. And they didn't care how he did it. So I, you know, wrote a story basically raising all those questions. Mm. And that was in May of 2001. And I thought, oh, yes, you know, I'm, I've won the Pulitzer. <laughs> <laughs> but it came out, and literally, I did not get a single phone call after that. Wow. And wow. Uh, seven years went by, and I knew that something was not right, but, you know, I'd kind of written my my piece. And then um, in December of 2000, in fact, it was um, almost exactly nine years ago, uh, I was sitting on my couch watching CNBC, and a headline came over saying that Bernie Madoff had been arrested in a $65 billion Ponzi scheme. And I jumped up and started swearing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, yeah, no, they uh, yeah, finally got him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, not long after that, I was approached by Penguin to write a book. Mm-hmm. So that's how, that's how that happened. So, so how hard was it if, if everybody was happy mm-hmm. with their returns and they were living in, the, in, in like a financial la-la land, how hard was it to get to in, any information about him, even from the client? Mm-hmm. Well, he didn't make it easy, um, which, you know, that's always a red flag when your financial advisor, you know, can't explain to you how he or she makes money. And, you know, he didn't have any online statement access. Um, he didn't offer people. What he did was um, he had a team of people who were using an old IBM AS400 computer. Um, Maybe some of your listeners have have heard of it. And uh, they were punching in phony stock gains and losses and printing out paper statements and mailing them out to thousands of people. And he got away with that for like 30 years. So that was a, that. That part really shocked me. Yeah, how could that happen? Like, did it, it, they had to know they were phony? The, these people Mm-mm. doing this input didn't know that that. They- oh, his, the people working for him? Yeah, they they knew something was fishy. Um, but the, the the interesting part was that he had a legitimate business on a completely separate floor of his building. Um, he had a very successful trading operation. At one point, I think Madoff Securities was trading, I don't know, 10% of all the New York Stock Exchange volume in the 90s. So that was kind of his cover story. And then in a separate, completely separate part of the building, um, he had this crew of secretaries and clerical workers and computer programmers who were just kind of going along with the charade, you know, on this on this super private hedge fund. I guess so they, they, were, knew, they were making they, good money. Yep. Yep. They didn't care. Uh-huh. And, um, 
You know, and uh, there were, you know, SEC people who came in to inspect him, but they never saw that part of it. Um, so he hid that very, very well. In fact, how, he actually... How could he do that? <laughs> you mean, how did he get away with it? Yeah, or with the FCC. He actually, at one point, you know, they would ask him, say, we want Anne Marie Kelly's statement from 1990, you know, show us where it is. And so they, he would run downstairs, <laughs> tell his clerical folks, all right, we need to cook up a statement for Anne Marie from 1990. They would print it out, you know, the whole oh, phony goodness. gains and losses. And, you know, sometimes the paper was so hot that they had to put it in the freezer. <sighs> And, you know, oh, pretend that it was, you know, 25 years old. Right, that they had just gotten it out of some remote mm -hmm. file. Right. Wow. Wow. amazing. Yep. And, uh, and uh, I presume that you that you sort of followed through. Mm -hmm. the, the, the word is that he, I mean, his, his one son killed himself. The other son That's died right. of, uh, a couple of years ago of uh, cancer. Of cancer. And apparently he has no remorse about anything he did. No, he doesn't. Um, he, I kind of liken him to a financial serial killer. I, I don't know how, what else, what other term wow. to use because, yeah. you know, he keeps saying, "Oh, I carried all of these investors all those years," and like, uh, you know, has no, um, there's no empathy. There's something missing. Sort of like the Ted Bundy of money. Yes, I like wow. that. Wow. So what was the biggest lesson, do you think, in, in all that study mm -hmm. and, and with all of your background, what, was the, what do you think is the biggest lesson that you took away from that? Well, um, the name of the book was called Too Good to Be True. Mm -hmm. And I picked that title because it just it made it perfectly described investing with Bernie Madoff. People knew it was too good to be true, but they did it anyway. And you know they had he had the SEC's blessing, and he was really powerful on Wall Street. So that was one that if it's too good to be true, it's just that's, you got to accept that. And then the other was that um, you know there's no shame in asking what you think are dumb questions. You know how does how does your money manager make money? Can I see you know can I talk to other clients? How much transparency is there? Do I really want to invest without getting any due diligence? So that was the big lesson for me. You know, you know what, Erin? I would, I, I, I would not ever think of doing that. I, mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of financial um, advisors, planners, and, mm -hmm. um, and have walked away, but not because I've asked smart questions like that. I just had a feeling mm -hmm. that it wasn't, that something wasn't, going to be right for me. Not that they were bad things. Not, not That's okay. Bad, but that There's they were nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But I but but that makes good sense to ask those kinds of questions to say can I talk to um, yeah. you know some of your other clients or is or see Sure. Yeah. Huh. Well, you know what, Erin, some of, some of the Victory Checks listening to us, as well as the mm -hmm. men who love us, need to be thinking about retirement. Sure. And, and you know, women are woefully behind the, the eight ball when it comes to money and retirement because we don't, you know, we take care of everybody else. We don't think about doing mm -hmm. that for ourselves. Now, you say that there are three phases to retirement, and there's different things we need to think about in each one of those phases. So can you expand on that? Sure. Um, there are, well, first of all, demographics are now playing a, a huge role because not only is, are all Americans living longer, but women are even living much longer. Mm. So we have, the, the, the term old doesn't work anymore. So there's, and I'm there's very a, happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we've got um, people who retire at 65. Well, that was kind of a made-up age because it was based on when Social Security thought people were going to expire. Um, you know, it was set up in the under FDR, and people weren't living at past 65 then. Yeah, if you lived to be 70, that was considered really old. Right. Yeah. And now, you know, the average lifespan for an American woman is above 86 and above. Mm-hmm. 
that's average. Mm-hmm. So really, like, old age is, is like, there's, like, young old, middle old, and, like, super old. <laughs> so when that's you're, kind you're of... you're hitting the 100-year mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, centenarians are not that big of a deal anymore. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's something that um, I think we need to take into account. And I've also talked to quite a few women who said, I can't afford to retire, you know, I've got, I'm still supporting my kids who are either millennials or in their 30s and their grandkids, and I can't, either I can't afford it or I'm bored out of my mind. Mm. So, but, so, Aaron, what are those three phases? Like, at what stage do we need to be thinking about certain things? Like, if you're, if somebody's in, mm-hmm. in that maybe 45 to 55 age group, sure. is, that, is that a phase? Sure, 45 to 50, absolutely. Um, that's the time to be socking money away. So um, can you put your paycheck on autosave? Mm. Does your employer offer any sort of a match? And even if they don't, that's okay. You can start with 50 bucks a month. Um, you know, have that automatically deducted out of your paycheck, and then you can, inc- you can even pro- you know program your savings to increase over time, so you won't even miss it. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yep. Hmm. And then um, the next phase is, you know, your pre if you if you choose to retire, you know, say at 65, then you're in pre-retirement in your 50s, and then you need to start looking at, okay, do I have the right um, type of funds? Do I want to have a target date retirement fund? I'm not a fan of those, but some people are. Um, I know a lot of women look at annuities, and probably better to look at them when you're younger than when you're older because they're high commission. Um, they lock up your money for, you know, seven to ten years, and um, they're not appropriate for everyone. So a lot of advisors will say, oh, you might want to look at an annuity, and they're getting a 7% commission on that. So you always want to find out what you're paying for that. And then, of oh, course, that's good to, to know. How good much to know. Yeah. And then, um, you know, if you do choose to retire at 65, you got to talk to an advisor and say, okay, before I, you know, cash out my 401K or, um, you know, open up another either traditional or Roth IRA, like, do I have enough money? Maybe I should work part-time. Mm-hmm. How will that affect my Social Security benefits? You know, what kind of taxes will I be paying? So that's kind of the nitty-gritty period. Okay, so when we, we, we need to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about the whole thing about women and retirement because a lot of times we focus on if the man's the primary wage earner, even mm-hmm. if the woman's the primary wage earner, that we're still focused on, on those phases and not being 80 and needing to have money. So when we come back, let's talk a little bit about women and their financial plan. So everybody stay close. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Hi, this is Anne Marie Kelly, author, victory strategist, and the radio show host of the Friday Happy Hour. I trust you're enjoying my conversation with this fabulous, victorious woman. If you're getting inspired with ideas and feeling empowered, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more for you. Tips, downloads, resources at the Victorious Woman Project. Go to victoriouswoman.com and look around and get on my mailing list so you can be the first to know about the newest good things I have for you. That's www.victoriouswoman.com. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Amory Kelly, and I'm here with Erin Arvidlund, the financial journalist for the Philadelphia Inquirer and Barron's, and we're talking about retirement and the phases of retirement. And before we went to break, that's what we were talking about, Erin, but... You, you wrote that women pay a higher economic price for divorce, separation, and widowhood compared to men. Mm-hmm. And, and I have to tell you this. A couple of years ago, one of my neighbors died. Now, he and his spouse, he was an ex-Duponer, mm-hmm. and, so, and they had a pretty good pension. And, uh, and she's, she was about 10 years younger. They had already downsized from their big house to a townhouse and then to a retirement community. And they, th- they were, she thought, in financially good shape. But when he 
died after a two-year illness, she went into a tailspin. Mm-hmm. Because I remember talking to her, and she said, well, ever, ever since he died, my, my financial situation is dramatically different. And she just wasn't expecting it. Is, is that a story you hear from women? I do. And uh, it frustrates me because I, first of all, you and I are different from our mothers um, in that, you know, maybe we weren't all stay-at-home mothers or we did, you know, we worked outside the house and we um, have some idea of what's going on with the finances. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women I talk to don't have any idea and nor do they have any interest. That's the scary. That, to me, that's the scary part. That's what frustrates me because I keep saying to them, what are you going, what, what do you, what do you not know that you don't know? Uh, where is your will? Where is your power of attorney? You know, um, where's where's the insurance policy? Mm. Just basic stuff, and it's the key to being happy in your retirement. And and you know what, Erin? If you don't know that for yourself, and maybe mm-hmm. you know, maybe your spouse knows where all that is. If mm-hmm. your spouse and your partner is the person who's taking care of it, sure. You're not prepping your kids. You know, sure. It happened. You know, you're driving and you're out in the car, and something happens, and both of you um, die in a car accident. Mm-hmm. Then what? What do your kids do? Right. So, um, you know, I really encourage women to say go to your fin- go to your financial planner with your spouse, with your partner, um, even if your eyes glaze over reading it, have them explain it to you, you know, have them have a conversation with you about this is what's going to happen if something happens to one or both of you. And then at least you have it in your head. And Mm -hmm. then you can, um, you know, if you're not, don't be intimidated because it's not, it's not that complicated. So um, I always encourage women to, like, get get into the conversation. We love to talk, right? We're talking mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so just, yeah. like, make it another, make it another, you know, coffee talk, but your financial advisor is sitting in the room. And that's a really good thing because, and, and you know, for all that we do, and I, I, I remember comparing this one time to cooking Thanksgiving dinner. Uh-huh. And, you know, we know how to make that happen. We know what we want is the end result. Yeah. And then we know how to work backwards from the end result. Mm-hmm. It really isn't different with the money. I mean, I mean, like right. it's more technical, but obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you start with the end result, and then you work work back to today. That's right. You know. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying it's it's easy, but I'm saying it is simple to get started. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think yeah. goals are, and I think goals are a part of that because if if I have kids and I want to, be, and they're not living here, and I want to be able to visit them, or if I've never traveled before mm-hmm. and I want to, you know, and before I get too old to travel, I want to be able to do that. Or the other thing is, and, and one woman told me this, that they had to buy a new car. She and her spouse had to buy a new car, and. They never thought about what it would take to buy a new car, uh-huh. whether they put the cash it was side for it or if they had a monthly car payment. Yeah, so um, I, in fact, uh, you know, talked to a financial advisor um, about, I interviewed him about a year or so ago, um, or almost two years ago now, about what he called a quote-unquote a life book. Mm-hmm which was just a notebook or a binder with all his important documents. And he set it up for himself and his, his wife. And um, I, rem- I remember that column, Erin. I really liked it. It was, it was a good one. Yeah, and um, it really it blew my mind because I thought, yes, this is how, this is what I need. So, you know, I, have, I don't have it all put together yet, but I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. I, have a, I have a binder. And, you know, when I think of it, you know, like um, when uh, we got our first home, you know, I put a copy of the mortgage in there, and I'm starting to add things over, to, over time. But what, what's in a life book? Okay, so I'm going to steal this idea for him. But um, a will, um, a, what's called a letter of last instruction, which is, you know, where is everything? 
Hmm. Um, where'd you put your assets? Where's your bank? Where's your insurance policy? Where's your um, retirement fund? Um, then there's the living will. So this is different from your, your other will. This is like what happens if you are permanently unconscious and um, you got to have a copy of that. And then, you know, other things too like powers of attorney and health care power of attorney that gives, you know, someone the power to make health care decisions for you. Yeah, everybody absolutely has to have those. Mm-hmm. You know, those because because if there's nothing there, you could be kept on life support forever and ever. Right. And right. nobody nobody wants to be like that. No. And um, yeah, so other stuff too. Like, it's not um, or it's not a uh, it's not perfect. You know, um, we don't. There's some things that we don't have yet. Um, you know, my husband and I are working on getting a will. So once we have that, we'll stick it in there. But you know, that's that's the um, that's the kind of thing that at least I can say, okay, I filed that away. It's sitting on the shelf. Yeah, and once a year you can look at it, update it, and any you know if something needs to be updated or mm-hmm. you know or whatever. But it, but if if it was if you and your spouse put it together, you and your partner put put it together, and then if something happened to one of you, you would know to go to that book. Right. You know, even, right. even like if you have a, a burial plot, then you would know this is where the burial plot is. You know, something. Mm-hmm. But it it seems like it's almost a silly thing, except that if you, if you need it and you can't find it, it's one piece of stress that you have extra at a bad time. That's right. Right. Yeah. Um, you've said it a couple of times, Erin, but that we should get a financial advisor. Now, my experience is that good ones are not easy to find, and uh, in fact, I, I think you write about this in one of your columns, and I had this experience where mm-hmm. I, I, it's somebody that I knew through a, a women's networking group, and she, uh, so we turned over our iris to her, and we didn't have, fortunately at that point, we had only just started and we didn't have a lot of money in, in her iris. Mm-hmm. Well, that was a good and bad thing. But, but anyway, we started really late. So, But I was getting a lot of paperwork. Every month I'd get a lot of paperwork. And I'd think, why am I, at the beginning I didn't think twice about it. But after about three months I thought, why am I getting this paperwork every month? And then it took me a couple of months after that to figure it out. But she was taking, let's say, $1,000 and investing it in three places and making a commission. Mm. And then next month she would take that money and move it to someplace else. And she was churning your account, yeah. And I was furious. Mm-hmm. What kind of stuff was she buying for you? Yeah, you know, it was, it was a while back, and I don't even remember. But but I, mm-hmm. the only thing that I remember at that point is that I had a REIT, and I said, "Do not touch my REIT," and she mm-hmm. was annoyed. But the but that year the only th- thing that made money for me was that REIT. Ah, see. And, it, you know, everything, we, we didn't lose money that year. We ended up, when, when I took it out of our hands, we had about the same amount of money, but it was at a time when the market was doing good and we could have made some money on that. Mm-hmm. She made money. Right. How do you know, how, like, how do you prevent, if, you know, as a woman, how mm-hmm. do you prevent that from happening to you? Yeah. Um I like, like I said before, I like uh, I like vetting people using references. You know, I say, can you give me the names of two or three clients I can talk to? Mm. Um, can you give me the name, you know, do you belong to, are you a, well, the main thing is, are you a fiduciary? Which basically means, are you obligated to do right by me legally? You have to do what's best for me mm. ahead of your, your own pocketbook Mm. and um, you can get that in writing you know it doesn't mean that you can't sign up with them if they're not you know if like it's a friend of yours who's a broker and maybe they're not a fiduciary that's okay at least you know that so those would be two things you know ask them are you a fiduciary and if 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 you if you are can I get it in writing do you have any, if they put it in writing, do you mm-hmm. have, is that, does that give you legal recourse? Yes. Hmm. Um, 
And uh, they might, you know, they might actually be less inclined to, you know, try and trade your account heavily if if you've you've got that, you know, in your in your in your hands. Hmm. Mm. So um, yeah, and then just talking to other clients, um, see if they're members of, you know, organizations like Financial Planners Association or um, are they fee only? In other words, are they going to charge you 1% of assets or are they going to charge you based on trades? Mm. Because if they're going to charge you based on trades, they're going to be incentivized to trade a lot. And that's and that's what happened to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, uh, Aaron, we have to take a, a break, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more. You mentioned annuities. I want to talk a little bit about those, and then I'd like you to give my listeners three things that they could be doing right now before we go into the new year. Sure. So uh, everybody hang, hang in there with us. We'll be right back. You're listening to the Friday Happy Hour. Are you one of those women who lived the first part of your life as a really good girl? That is, you did all the right things and followed all the so-called rules for women. I was like that, too. But have you noticed that once you pass 40, you have less patience for those rules? Maybe you even think that the rules really don't make sense for you anymore. Maybe they never did and you just didn't realize it. Do you want to go where other recovering good girls meet to inspire each other and support their new empowered selves? Then join me, Anne-Marie Kelly, and some very fabulous Victorious Women. We're on Facebook at The Victorious Woman Project. So go to facebook.com forward slash Victorious Woman Project. I'll talk to you there. Welcome back to the Friday Happy Hour. I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm here with Erin Arvidlund. And Erin, we were talking about, well, you, you wrote, I was reading one of your blogs about, about mm-hmm. annuities as a solution to what is in some circles being called yeah. crash-proof retirement. Mm-hmm. But yeah, really, is there anything that's really a crash-proof retirement? Um, well, that's that's their trade name, so you know I can't I can't speak oh, to that. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that that was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, the idea I think behind a lot of um, annuities is that you know when you're if you're worried about market volatility, um, you can avoid that you know by putting some of your money into a product that it's basically an insurance policy and it pays you you know the same. Um, payment every year, and um, it can be very appropriate for, um, particularly you know, for people who kind of want to force themselves to save, um, know that they're not going to need the money. You know, if you if you're going to need it, it's not appropriate. Mm. Um, so yeah, and um, you know, annuities came under some scrutiny in the last couple years because the fees were very high. You know, some of them were up to like. Ten percent, and um, so wow, that's you know, yeah, it's pretty high. Um, yeah. So a colleague of I and, and I wrote a story about um, one of the local um, shops that sells these, and um, just kind of looking at, you know, how they make they make annuities make a great deal of money for the people who sell them, mm-hmm. but maybe not so much um, as people think. Um, you know, they think it's like a way to protect themselves from the market ever crashing. And um, if you're comfortable with that, that's fine. But I'm, you know, we wrote the story basically to explain that there are some, some downsides as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it, I, I, and I could understand what you're saying. If you're going to do it, get it early because the other mm-hmm. thing is that if, if you get an, an annuity like at 55 and you know, you die at 60, then you've been putting all that. You you usually don't get that money back, right? Uh, when's that? If, if I if I if I my if I got an mm-hmm. annuity at 55 and I started collecting at 60 mm-hmm. and then died, then the, you don't get that money back. No, Mm-mm. no. So you put that money in for however many years it was, and then yeah, it's locked up. That yep. doesn't seem right. That's the way it is. <laughs> so that's the you know the exchange that you give the insurance company yeah. for underwriting that policy. Yeah. So, Erin, what what do you think there are? What three things do you think my listeners should be thinking about doing right mm-hmm. now as we go into the New York New Year to sort of sure. to protect themselves to get themselves financially in good shape? Sure. Um, so the main thing that I've been writing about is. Um, the tax bill, 
And um, mainly what's what's going on with that is some deductions might be going away, like um, uh, state and local tax, you know, might be reduced, those deductions, medical, and um, charitable. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, you know, have a big, um, make a big charitable donation, this would be the year to do it because you can still take the write-off in 2017. Huh. Um, if you have a big, you know, medical procedure that you could possibly <laughs> get done in the next two weeks <laughs> and pay for, um, this would be the year to do it. Um, and then, yeah, the um, I know it's tough many times to prepay your state and local taxes. A lot of towns and municipalities don't don't offer that, but um, yeah, prepaying. Mm if you can believe it. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think the main thing, too, is, like, don't worry so much if you don't understand, um, you know, all your finances right away. Like, it took me years and years. So I try not to beat myself up if I don't know everything. Yeah, and I, and I do the same, but but I will, I will tell my listeners that one of the things that I found personally, um, I, I guess I would say – eye-opening was that I joined for a little bit of time a better investing club or mm-hmm. you know, like one of those clubs where it's the people doing the you know, sure. a, a, an yeah. club thing. There's two um, in the area that I like. There's um, betterinvesting.org, mm-hmm. and, um, which is completely run by its members, and then there's AAII, which is American Association of Individual Investors, and they have a Philly chapter, and I think there's one in South Jersey, too. Hmm. Well, that's good. So, yeah. Well, Erin, this was it, this was eye-opening. I like this, hearing all this stuff about Bernie Madoff, but the, but you gave us some good tips, at least a, a way of getting started. You know, like a little bit of a track to run on, so that we yeah. we can start making those, you know, making some headway with our finances and absolutely, get, you know, become more financially literate. Yeah, and it can be fun too. It can be like learning, you know, learning a new uh, new skill. Yeah, I think so. Sometimes it seems, it seems, any of those STEM things, science, you know, it, they don't always seem like they're appealing. But when you get into into it, sometimes you can figure it out in a way that is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Erin, um, tell me. I, I look forward to reading more of your good stuff in your column in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Is there? How can people get to read some of your articles? Absolutely. So you can go to Philly dot com and uh, search under my name. Um, or you can pick up the paper if you're still, you know, into the, the dead tree version. It's on, I write to Sundays and Mondays. Um, but, yeah, come to – and I also post my, my uh, stories on um, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, but the main place is philly.com. And I posted a, that link on today's radio wrap-up. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Have a great weekend and wonderful holidays. Thanks again, Emory. Thank you. Bye. And the same to you, Victory Chicks, and you guys. And listen, just in case you're rethinking the whole gift thing, in these last 10 days before Christmas, I wanted to share two articles with you. I posted both of them on today's radio wrap-up because they talk about how, as adults, we don't really need to be doing the whole gift thing with other adults. Now, I, I believed in that my, like my, my whole adult, most of my whole adult life. Uh, you know, we, we're making ourselves crazy buying gifts that we don't, we don't know if the people will like. And then we get gifts that we either give away to somebody else or sell on eBay or at a flea market. And in the end, the only thing really that matters, and it's the thing that even science has proved is important for our good mental, physical, and emotional health, is the getting together with people and sharing, sharing ourselves in, in some special way, sharing the love, the laughter of the season. That's what really matters. So, so do that. Forget the gift giving for adults, even if your kids, even your kids and your nieces and nephews. You know, I'm, I, I, so I'm letting you off the hook. You're getting the Anne Marie Kelly Friday Happy Hour gift giving dispensation. See, now I can't help it. That whole Catholic thing always comes. You know, you get those dispensations. So you're getting the Anne Marie Kelly Friday Happy Hour gift giving dispensation. And if anyone has a problem with with not getting a gift, direct them to today's radio wrap up. And those two articles, I posted both of them so that you can take a look at them. Oh, but listen, not your grandkids. The little ones still like presents. And I hope you include some fun stuff in your weekend plans, even if it's just taking a little time to start binge-watching a TV series. 
tonight I'm meeting an old friend. His name's John, and we used to exercise together. Um, I was probably newly married when I met John. And uh, he's the one, I might have told you about him a long time ago that I used to exercise with, but then we lost touch in about a year ago. A year ago, I found him on LinkedIn. Well, he lives in Florida now, but his mom passed away recently, so he's in town for the memorial. And Joseph and I, had, weather permitting, we haven't, I don't know, the weather doesn't look so good, but hopefully the weather will be okay and we can meet with him. And tomorrow night I'm going to a dinner dance hosted by my dance teacher, Valerie. You, you know her. She's over on West Town Road, but right next to the, she's right above that consignment shop. She does a nice event a couple times a year. But you know what? Between tonight and tomorrow, I have to see if I can find my first floor. You know, after that tornado that came through a couple weeks ago, the whole first floor went missing. I managed to find the kitchen, but, you know, that's about it. Wait, wait, you say there wasn't a tornado? You mean my first floor has been there all this time? And I just haven't been able to find it because it's covered with Christmas stuff? Ha, huh, how about that? Well, then I guess I have to say I'm spending time tomorrow cleaning up the mess I made while trying to decorate for Christmas. Because my house does look like a tornado blew through it. I hope you're doing something more fun. And I hope you come back next Friday to join me for the Friday Happy Hour. And I'm going to leave you with this quote from Bob Hope, who said, My idea of Christmas, whether old-fashioned or modern, is very simple. Loving others. Come to think of it, why do we have to wait for Christmas to do that? Something to chew on, huh? Stay safe, stay warm, and I'll talk with you again next week. Jen's on. Thanks for listening to this Friday Happy Hour. Make sure you subscribe, rate and review today's show. And join us again next week for the Friday Happy Hour with Anne-Marie Kelly.